Welcome back. We're, today we're going to look at a recent over-the-board game I played against uh, Fred Allsbrook. A uh, strong 2100 rated uh, USCF member. So I uh, was playing just in a local uh, team versus team match. My team had invited me uh, to play this time on the B team and uh, I took up that invitation because it sounded like a fun thing to do despite the match being like middle of the week pretty late at night time control being 45 and 90 plus sudden death 60 with a five second delay so theoretically we could have been well with five second delay with uh, upper bound upper move limit bound of like 5,000 moves. Theoretically, you could have been there till dawn, but um, we did manage to uh, leave before midnight. So, without further ado, let's take a look at the game. Um, my opponent opens knight f3. This is already not something I've very thoroughly prepared for, because it's not something I face very often. Um, so, I've considered two main replies here. Um, d5, which I've played before, and knight f6, which I've not played before. Um, ultimately decided to go with the opening I have played. So, And then my open opponent continues the ready system here. And by this point, um, <laughs> well I guess this is a Nimsovich Larson. This is recognized as the Larson attack. Um, I'm not thoroughly familiar with all the nuances of the ready, the larson, and so forth. Um, I was surprised to see this. Um, and so I tried to think, well, how can I get a position that resembles anything that I recognize? Because I've not studied this aspect of chess very thoroughly. These are some openings I really need to take a closer look at. It's true that in recent weeks I have been looking more at uh, the Queen's Indian defense, trying to get a better appreciation of what's going on there. But um, here we are with like, well this is a Larson. If white plays e3, then you get a very similar pawn structure as the Queen's Indian defense. Again, I'm, I just resolved that I'm going to play sensible development moves activate my pieces. I didn't exactly obey the knights before bishop's rule, but I wasn't sure whether I wanted my knight to go to c6 or d7, or just bring out my other knight first, or if I was going to put my pawn on c6 or on c5, or I figure I'm probably putting my pawn on e6, maybe playing h6 at some point. So that was my game plan. Uh, I really need to study more expert and master games and better to appreciate what's going on in this opening system, but um, I'll try not to belabor the opening too much because most of it consists of me just not fully understanding what's going on here. Um, by this point I wanted to commit to playing e6. I didn't know again what the opening consisted of here, um, but I noticed that if I play e6 uh, I'm kind of walling my bishop in front of my pawn, so I want to leave open the possibility of playing bishop d7. But also I recognize that at some point I'm probably going to play bishop h7. So I did play h6 here after much contemplation, just I'm not sure what I'm doing. Um, I'm sure basically everybody viewing this probably knows the system better than I do. Probably can tell me, oh look, you made all these terrible mistakes in the opening what are you doing playing chess sort of thing. I don't know. So again, I'm not going to try to belabor what happened in this opening phase. I just tried to play reasonable moves. I managed to um, convince my opponent to play h3 here. I figured, if nothing else, this is something he doesn't play every day. Like, yes, you will find opponents that line up their pieces in this way, but h3 is really not something white wants to play in any opening where he also has played g3 and bishop g2. Um, granted, I do have some kingside weaknesses of myself, of my own, to worry about, but 
um, yeah, I'm not, I figured this is a reasonable thing for me to do. This does not gain a tempo, it just impedes my opponent's ability to castle. On the other hand, I still have to figure out where to develop my pieces so I can castle. So I don't know how to exploit this position. White could probably comfortably play g4 and even g5 at some point, but I've got some kind of hook to hook onto to try to build some initiative later in the game. Um, so that was my hope, my dream endeavor, and so forth. Um, so I observe that my opponent is eventually going to castle. Uh, I allow him to do so. I figure there's no way white's going to castle kingside because it's a very risky move. And what would he really gain from doing it? Um, so my opponent liquidates on d5, and at this point I'm thinking, well, they want to play rook c1 and attack my queen. This much is obvious. Um, also in the cards, it's like moves like knight c3, threatening knight d5, threatening knight b5, a lot of really unpleasant things if this pawn moves. So, despite all the inconveniences this causes, and I was looking at this, these sorts of variations earlier in the game and burning um, lots of time, as if my clock were on fire, it was just burning all my time trying to calculate can I, what things can I play to keep an imbalanced position um, where I'm not worse. So, uh, I was spending a lot of time in this opening phase because I didn't know what I was doing. And we'll back up after the game analysis and take a closer look at the opening, but for now, let's just get to um, the heart of what happened later on in this game. Um, so my opponent's threatening an obvious pawn fork, um, but I recognized I could just move my knight back. And surely I'm not worse here. My opponent has not moved anything beyond their third rank, their development is slightly faster than mine, but they've got a structure that's going to take a very long time for them to do anything useful with. Meanwhile, my knights are very well placed. I don't have any holes in my pawn structure, and it's still not clear whether I'm castling kingside or queenside, although I'm thinking probably kingside. Um, so, that all said, um, here... Somewhat in despair, I give up on the idea of playing pawn, or I, I play pawn e6, giving up on my idea of like g5 and bishop g6 and such. I spent like forever looking at g5, trying to convince myself that it was a reasonable thing to do, and ultimately concluded, well, my opponent gets the center, I get a pawn on g5, I really don't have any follow-up to that. So I just instead uh, uh, decide to hunker down and claim that I've got this pretty safe, intact pawn structure and not sure what my opponent's doing, other than slowly advancing. Um, so if nothing else, this is a way to learn um, how do you play the white side of this position. You give this position to your opponent, and have them show you um, what your mistakes are. So I play this proactively. I'm not going to wait around. There's, I re recognize I'm not going to get to take an h3. I've already provoked this h3 strength or weakness, but it is a hook that I'm able to attack at some point. So now the question is, can, do I have enough time to castle queenside and launch a kingside attack? Spent an incredible amount of time in this opening trying to figure out which way should I be castling? Because I'm still, again, not familiar with this category of position. Um, anyway, let's continue. Oh, wait, I did not play this. Um, I did not play this. I castled. And then they played e4, and I stepped back. And I've got pressure on d3. I think white has a space advantage, but... Um, the fact that they've managed to blockade their bishop while giving me some things to target and that the pawn's not going to go anywhere, but if the pawn does advance, then I get the d5 square. means that black is pretty solid here, I think. 
but I don't really know what's going on. Let's Stockfish shows a strong preference for the white pieces here. Um, should I leave it going a bit? No. Yeah, so you just develop your pieces and play chess. This is basically what this comes down to. And the better player can win out of this position, although white has the slightly or somewhat preferable position. Um, and my opponent immediately plays d4. I did not think they would do this. I mean, I thought this was a candidate move for sure, but it undermines white's center. So it's very inflexible. And now both of his bishops are blocked by the pawns. Um, at this point, like, again, I don't know what I'm doing. Having a plan would be tremendously useful here. I was looking at things like a5, trying to threaten a4, but if I play a5, they just play b a4. Uh, if I don't play a5, or if I play like b5, then they'll play rook c1 and b4, and I'll have this terrible, well, they might have to play a3 at some point too, but I'll have this terrible hole on c5 they'll never be able to patch. There really isn't a way for black to proceed without creating some kind of weakness here. So black's plan apparently is to bunker down and just not do anything. Um, Stockfish likes queen b8 here. And then a5, a4, rook d8, bishop f1, c5. Hmm. Alright, so I guess the thing to play for here is c5 still. Thematically, black does want to try to play for c5 or e5, but having the queen on the c-file gets in the way of that. So Stockfish suggests I play things like queen b8, a5, um, rook d8, and then throw c5 in here. That way I'm not subject to this pin, that way I've tried to provoke some weakness on the queen side, that way I have plenty of places to move all my pieces, and then I can play c5 while I have d5 under control. That's a reasonable plan. Um, I settled on rook d8, which I didn't know what else was going to go in combination with it, but I knew that this rook on a8, well I'm sorry, the rook on f8 would only support an f5 advance, and I'm not going to push f5. Also, I'm not going to play at the rook, I mean, I could have played the rook to e8, but I felt that this other rook on a8 had a future somewhere on the a, b, or c file. Um, I didn't really know, though. Chess is hard. If nobody's told you that, um, public service announcement, chess is a difficult game. Rook c1 is pretty obvious. Yeah, and here, this is the moment where I should have figured out what was going on. Queen b8, as Stockfish suggests, makes a ton of sense, trying to prepare a c5 advance. I didn't think c5 was viable, but um, our silicon friend says so, so I guess it must be viable. Throughout most of this game, I kept miscounting how many pieces were controlling various squares. It's not a skill I've had to exercise very often, because that's part of a strategic chess game and most of my games these days are blitz, and strategy does not play a large part in those games. Um, so queen b8 allowing me to prepare for c5 would make a lot of sense. Possibly even queen to b8, a5, queen a7, and rook c8. Um, that is, bring the queen over and up here, this pawn up, and this rook over to protect this square. I know all this is blend all the markers are blending in with the board. Um, sorry about that. Um, if I could do better, um, well, I don't know. I could. I looked at like the red markers too, and they also kind of blend in. This board doesn't make it easy to highlight things, but just imagine the queen's out of the way and the rook on a8 here is transferred over to where the queen's standing. There's some way to make the c5 advance viable. I just did not find it. Having already burned a third of my time uh, just getting to this position and already being considerably down on time, it was not a good situation. Um, so the best I came up with was knight f8. 
with the thought that I'm going to come up with something to advance in, on the king side, because that's how I typically play, is just attack on the king side. Turns out you can't do that in every position, but that's what I came up with. Uh, my opponent... I was also kind of awaiting, like, what's my opponent doing here? Because d4 seems very premature. If they play e5, I just put my knight on d5, so it's very difficult to see where their bishops are going to move. Um, just given all the pressure I have in this position. Another thought I had was just like try to play rook d7, queen e8, and rook a d8. Um, that is without these pawn moves, and just like get the queen over, double the rooks on the d-file, and maybe try to find some way to break through on the d-file. Though there aren't many targets there. My opponent's position is remarkably or surprisingly solid to me. Uh, another thought was like try to bring transfer my queen um, up and over this way and try to cause some mayhem with this knight, this pawn, maybe even go over to h5. Um, I did not have a clear plan. I rarely do during slow games even. Although this was like 45 and 90 instead of 40 and 90, so I was feeling a lot of pressure. I uh, had burned like 10 more minutes to get to this position, so half my time has been expended. I have another 30 moves to go before time control. And my opponent's like up 20 to 30 minutes on me, so it was not a good situation. Um, 95. Very resourceful. I didn't think of this. This, like, every one of my opponent's moves is catching me by surprise, since I've never seen anything like it before. Um, I assume knight e5 is strong, because, like, it puts the knight on a very active square and prepares to push, like, f4 and g4, and, like, what could I possibly do against this? Um, Stockfish is saying, like, Try to put the knights in a position to start trading some pieces or something. Or drop this knight back and push f6 if you can. But, um, scary stuff. Uh, I elected to try to exchange for this scary knight. I expected my opponent to just take on d7. And I recognized, yes, my opponent's better here, but not nearly enough to win the game. Well, okay, I expected them to take. My second guess was knight to d3. Because the knight on d3 can hump, hop to a number of important squares. Uh, apparently, um, going to c4 and then to e3 might be even better. But I was expecting this knight to move. Uh, and it did, actually. Um, although I was really hoping for a knight exchange. That didn't happen. Um, and so I brought my queen out for lack of a better plan. I could have gone knight back to f6. I was just afraid of these pawn advances. Um, hmm, this is a position worth studying. I mean, yes, I could ask our silicon friend what's going on, but only because, like, I just kept burning more and more and more time during the game going about 10 minutes a move, um, with about 30 moves to go till time control. And this would be a good thing for me to try to figure out here. It is an interesting thought exercise. Um, so the first part uh, of any position is like try to identify the imbalances in the position, the strengths, weaknesses, targets, etc. Just general concepts in the position. And then after having done that, go identify some candidate moves. At least in theory, that's how you're supposed to do it. The larger the knowledge of game positions you have, the better you'll do with um, recalling ideas that other strong players have played, and it'll be a lot easier for you to find the key ideas in your own games. My problem here is I've got tons of candidate moves a6, b6, f6, g6, king h8, knight f6, bishop f6, bishop d6, knight b6, knight b8, 
like all these things make some degree of sense. And then there's the queen advances, like queen d6, queen b6, queen a5. And there's some more aggressive pawn moves too. So you need some kind of knowledge to be able to narrow down what in the world is going on here. I was just very much deer in the headlights in this kind of position. <laughs> like, uh, I'm sure there's an idea. I did look at forcing lines with like queen a5 and ultimately realized that queen a5 has a very good chance of getting my queen trapped if I go pawn hunting on the queen side and does not really contribute in a positive way on the king side on a5 any more than it does on c7. Um, I looked at b6 and I'm like, yeah, the c5 is never happening though, and b6 weakens me on the longest diagonal, um, on the long, on the light squared long diagonal where my opponent's bishop is facing my rook. Um, I looked at a6 and a5 and realized. Yeah, but those give me weaknesses, and there's no clear... Without me being able to play c5, it's not clear what a6 or a5 achieves. Especially if my opponent can just block my pawn advance, or sidestep it if I play a4. They could play b4, or they themselves could play a4 before I get a chance to. So, I'm struggling on the queen side. I considered bishop f6 but realized, um, I mean, yeah, you have to play something here. You're absolutely right. I looked at bishop f6 and realized, well, my opponent still controls the center. This doesn't actually help me push e5. Um, and in some tactical lines, my opponent might be able to push e5 in, in order to open the light squared long diagonal. Um, so... Plus, bishop f6 makes me prone to a f4, g4, g5 advance, which might require my opponent to play either knight c4 or knight f3 at some point, but the bishop on f6 really doesn't do anything that it's not already doing on e7, and it welcomes bishop a3 if I play bishop f6, so that's kind of out. Um, king h8 seemed like a useful waiting move, except it puts my king on the wrong square because it's lined up immediately with my opponent's bishop. This is a recurring theme that I would like to play king h8 and try to get my rook over to g8 and just shove everything on the king's side, but yeah. yeah. There's a lot going on in this really rich position. So, okay, I'm these were some of my thoughts during the game, because I couldn't identify... I struggled with identifying imbalances here. White has a space advantage. Black's bishop on h7 is looking stupid. But in order to improve the position of that bishop, Black's got to, like, hack down White's center. And there's all kinds of repercussions to trying to do so. Um... Any pawn advance black makes also ruins black's position, so... Um, I'm still thinking maybe I should have gone with what I was thinking during the game, which was queen a5. Actually, that's what I played during the game, so maybe I'm okay with that, but... I thought my idea of queen a5 followed by queen a6 was pretty clever here. I'm trying to apply some pressure on my opponent's queen side maybe get a queen trade in, and maybe that would help me apply more pressure on d2, uh, d4, and adding more pressure on d4 might give me the leverage I need to make a pawn lever like c5 or e5 successful. It's a lot of speculation. Um, another thing that would be sensible here would be just rook a to c8. Um, recognizing that like, I am going to do a pawn lever c5 at some point. It's inevitable, and I should just build for it and make it happen. But the disadvantage of doing that is that it makes a5 more difficult to push. Um, so, actually, they my opponent's kind of threatening to play b4 here if I shift my rook away. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of at a loss here. So you're suggesting b6 because I have to play something. But 
I'm like convinced that b6 horribly weakens my queen side and limits the mobility of my queen. Um, like I'm really very concerned about my opponent pushing e5. Um, concerned about this pawn e5 and then knight c4 to d6. And that's my largest concern in this position. Um, I'm not saying that they're immediately going to drop the knight in there, because in many cases that just loses material, but it's very difficult for me to do anything about that plan. Meanwhile, I don't have a plan. Um, so I need to be very resourceful with my next few moves, or I just get squished. Um, Knight takes d5 looks odd. Okay. Your main problem is your opponent has two central pawns to your one. Yes, this is true. Absolutely. This. Um, so, we're suggesting take a closer look at some of this. Oh, knight a6? Okay. Yeah, hindsight. Like, I see this after the game, and it seems pretty obvious after the game. Um, I wish I'd thought of this during the game. Somehow I had, I thought I was playing a Karo-Khan sort of structure, and I just thought my knight was well placed on d7, because it has the ability to jump to either c5 or e5, and if the other knight moves, then lots of things can happen, but I don't have anywhere to move this knight. So just, let's see. Okay, if I'm going through the trouble to keep line up this battery, I should keep it here. So, what I was calculating during the game, um, let's say we do knight a6. Because it seems like a good pragmatic try here. Uh, obviously there's not going to be any refutation of knight a6. Black is not in any major trouble at this point. Knight a6 makes a lot of sense. At least, um, you know, might as well keep the battery going. I thought the knight wasn't going to spend very long on that square, and I was very mistaken about that. Um, so, of all these candidate moves of my opponent, which ones was... I mean, I wasn't even like looking at candidate moves for my opponent. There's so many things white can do here. Um, and I'm very unfamiliar with this kind of pawn structure. Um, but, yeah, it's a practical matter. Just keep the battery there. My go-to in chess just uh, tends to be trying to calculate variations, because I just don't have nearly enough knowledge to uh, conduct plans in other ways. But, um, okay, yeah, no, that's a fair point. I'm sorry, that was another concern I had. Like, this is a Kiro Khan sort of concept. Um, I actually have two possible captures here. Right, now this is definitely a Kiro Khan thing. You see this, like, all the time there. Um, now, of course, I would look at the specifics of this position and evaluate the two options, but um, I was very optimistic that one of these two options is good. Um, and honestly, I was thinking G takes, but I wasn't going to calculate everything out. Oh. Oh. Yeah, this... Okay. London is a thing I don't know much about, but no, you're right. This does very strongly resemble a London, and I have a very low opinion about the London because it's easy for the opponent to equalize in what a, in games that I've seen. So, but yeah, try to use London ideas in this position. Yeah, I've read a book on the London. I read the whole, like, 100-page book 
trying to figure out what's so great about this opening. And it pretty much just came out to meh. It's an opening, you can play it. Um, uh, like, it really wasn't the most inspiring book, I guess. Hey, welcome. Uh, so, yeah, I think you're right. I should have played this more like a London here. Yeah, right, so I was not terribly concerned about this, because I thought GTEx was probably good. And even if GTEx was, ended up being a bad thing, I have this backup idea of e takes, which might work. Um... Yeah, no, I think no joke's probably right. The London, you can easily equalize against it if you study it. Um, there's several well-known... I've heard from other chess experts. There are several simple lines you can learn to equalize without much difficulty. And it's not very scary. Uh, the Tory is a lot more interesting, in my opinion. Well, that and in the database statistics and in... Uh, game analyses that I've seen published by masters. So, um, let's see. Just because the C file generally opens, and my queen feels very strange on C8. Yeah, right. Right, now queen C8 is very strange. I agree. But yeah, I should apply just like normal London ideas. Or just don't play the London. But, um,. No, you're right, this is a London. This exactly follows things that I've read. Uh, I think it was in Soltis' book, but he was showing it all with the white pieces. And yeah, I just do the things that he mentioned and it'd be okay. There's plenty of ways you can structure your piece. It's a very flexible opening. It's just not particularly inspiring. Right. Uh, triangles. Okay, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, oops, yeah, c6, e6. Um, you just over protect the, all the light squares and just wait for your opponent to checkmate you. Um, no, not really, but you just, um, try to do constructive things, but it's not so easy to do so. Um, but yeah, like playing the bishop onto d6. Um, it's a typical thing. So, uh, but it's not so effective here against g3. Yeah, throughout the opening I was wavering back and forth as to, like, should I just throw in g5 and bishop g7 and castle and king h7 and then rook back to g8 and just try to go for mate. Um, I just thought my position was particularly pathetic here, and so I did not opt for that kind of really aggressive strategy, and I don't think that would have been any good. Um, but queen c8 is pretty terrible, honestly, so... Um, yeah, I just suffocated my position and proceeded to make it worse and worse and complicate things, and, well... Uh, it was not a very good practical choice, and it burned all the time on my clock, too. So, yeah, my opening choices were pretty dubious here. Um, and even having played queen c8, I didn't make the best of that either. Yes, no, absolutely. Um, I still need to figure out, though, like... Okay, suppose I do do this. Either do... After this, I could do London ideas, or... Oops, it's black to move. Um, I wonder. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff black can play here. I just need some kind of inspiration. Um, yeah, I do have to pick something, and bishop f5 is pretty committal. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. So, yep, and Nazengoid's saying the same thing. Like, if I'm going to play something committal, here's a committal move. This one's fun. Why didn't I do this? This looks way more fun than what I picked. And now my opponent isn't going to play g3. I mean, yeah, I do have to learn a couple things, but... Um, now, again, knights before bishops, and it limits my options with my pawn structure and such. 
Yeah, it's right. This is a different game, for sure. Um, but that's not to say that's any good either. Um, uh, let's take a look at the database, see like what our candidate moves are, because I really don't have any idea. I mean, I considered like g6 and knight f6 and stuff, but I'm like, I don't know any of this. And so yeah, I tried to reinvent the wheel. And I should have just tried to do something, except that I'm getting a worse position, and um, not try to do like ridiculously combative things like I'm known to do. Knight f6 and c5 are two strong candidate moves. Okay. Yeah, I considered c5 and kind of freaked out at the possibility of it because I don't know that category of positions at all. But um, c5 makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, bishop g4 seems like a lot easier to learn. Uh, c6 is a possibility, but I don't like it, I guess, because it's just a wasted pawn move. I mean, black might want to play c5 at some future point, so if you're going to pick between c6 and c5, pick c5. Knight c6 is actually something I considered during the game, and I was like, we could go here and there even. Um, not that you'd want to do this, you wouldn't want to play d4, but um, this is a thing. Um, but. Uh, white just plays bishop b2, and I'm not able to get an e5 advance in, although I could play f6. And then having played f6, I could push for e5, but then my opponent has d4. A very different game that I've never seen before. Um, um, and probably, it seems like all black's play here is very... Black needs to find a tactical solution before he gets squashed. So maybe you, I don't know, zug it up or something. You play like knight h6 to f7, play e5. Um, maybe it's doable. Um, um, it's not at all in the master database, but it's a very weird position. And if anybody's seen this before, it's my opponent. Um, who picked uh, the Larson opening. They've seen everything you could play against the Larson, so I shouldn't do something wildly unfamiliar, but this does look reasonable. Um, probably castle queenside in these positions. Hey, that works for me, because I like launching kingside pawn attacks, or pawn storms. That's a fun thing to do. Um, yeah, it seems like my opponent was going to double Fianchetto, although I didn't know that. If I'd known that off the bat, I would have just played bishop g4, and the double fianchetto strategy is kind of out. Or rather, they have to play knight e5, and it's a different game, because I could play bishop f5, I could play bishop h5. Um, it's a whole new game here. Um, so I should learn some of this stuff. But your points were that c5 is a candidate move, and knight f6 is a candidate move. And these don't lose the possibilities of playing moves like bishop g4 or bishop f5 and such. It's just a transpositional possibility. Um, yeah, bishop f5 is most common. Um, so... Let's assume that this is perhaps the simplest one to learn, because the London's not that hard to learn, to, at least to play. Uh, h6 is very London-y, but yeah, here I have to just play London ideas like e6 and c6. And bishop d6 is not so convincing here. Um, that's kind of a problem in this position. I was not sure where this black, this dark squared bishop would go particularly because of g3. Yeah, bishop e7 is a possibility. Hmm. Um. I'm not sold on it either. 
I mean, almost equally reasonable to bishop e7 is just play g5 and bishop g7. It looks nuts. I was terrified of trying to do that during the game with my ro opponent's rook still on h1. But, um... Yeah, it's not clear what black's plan is either. <laughs> so, like, yeah. I think... In the interest of not having to calculate every possible variation, I should pick something a bit more restrictive. I think bishop g4, despite the fact that leads to like Trompowski like positions, I don't yet know them. I think I could get the I could learn the Trompowski faster than I could learn how to solve all the problems with the London, because I really don't believe in the London. Um it just happens to be like I don't know queen pawn openings very well either, <laughs> so uh, it's it's a big hole in my repertoire as I approach 2000 USDF. <laughs> How in the world I could possibly make expert and not know uh, queen pawn openings is kind of a mystery, but uh, yeah, I should learn some of this stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, this, this is like, why am I playing these games if I have no idea what I'm doing and my opponent's known better? I, I had, it was kind of a surprise to me that I was paired with such a strong opponent in this round. <laughs> but yeah, I should learn some of these things. Uh, just play knight of six and e6 and bishop e7 and play chess. And play uh, b6 and bishop b7. Okay. It seems like something I could play and not get murdered in the opening. It seems pretty pleasant, actually. That never crossed my mind. That makes a lot of sense. And I don't even have to deal with French problems here, because my opponent can't play pawn to e4 to e5. Like, I've tried playing a French before, and been really frustrated with that, but here, uh, my problematic light-scored bishop does not mean that I'm doomed, because my opponent does not have a huge center yet. Um, yeah, right. And there's no need to immediately play e6 either. Um, I mean, goodness, because uh, I've read books on the Karo count, I could play things like g6 here, and even allowing bishop takes knight, I'm still okay. Uh, I've actually played a number of games, um, well, this is a different opening, but I've played some systems in high school, some un like dozens and dozens of blitz games where my opponent would subject themselves to this pin, and I'd throw in g4, g5, and just swap off the bishops. So I have experience playing really weird opening stuff. But, um, that's not to say g6 is any good, but it's better than what I played. Um, like, what I played is just trash. Like, I don't have a high opinion of the London, and I played a really bad, bad, bad London. Uh, so, um, so yeah, there's numerous ways I can improve this. First and foremost is probably just play knight f6 to start everything off. Figure out what my opponent's doing. They have to commit to something. And once, I mean, they probably put bishop b2. Um, and then take it from here. Like, worst case, yeah, just play e6 and bishop e7 and castle and... Um, just play a slightly cramped but comfortable game. Um, best case, play something more aggressive, like any of the things that masters play. Um, although they do play e6 here. I'm very surprised to see that that's the most popular move in the masters database. Um, that leaves me very surprised. Like, I would never have guessed that this is the most popular move. 
Um, okay, yeah, I guess all the other moves added together outweigh it, but by a lot. So I guess um, masters either like randomly pick something or pick something that they've prepared in advance, but still there's no consensus on the best thing to play here. Um, main reason you play c5 early is to try to lock their bishop out with d4. So yeah, push pawn to d4, supported by c5, if they've really messed up. Um, yeah. Playing c5, though, does expose me to the fact that I've never played this kind of weird pawn center thing before, where I've played with d5 and c5 facing nothing. Like, usually there's some kind of marker somewhere, um, one of these center squares, for something for me to aim at and know what's going on. Uh, it gets much more difficult to calculate the pawn tensions when your opponent hasn't declared what they're doing with their pawns yet. Um, but yeah, c5 does have benefits for sure. Um, I should look at games that feature stuff like that. I mean, yeah, white did win many of these games, but that's not to say that the opening's any good. Um, say we do this. I mean, yeah, I don't know. This is complicated. Oh, okay, what well, was also 100 points? You're right. Right, yeah, like I'm saying, it's not necessarily because of the opening. Um, both players are trying to do something to get an original position, and they succeeded at that. But, um, yeah, there's just a lot of pawn tension possibilities to calculate, and I don't know queen pawn things very well at all. Um, but it looks like either way I'm going to be burning a lot of time in unfamiliar positions, so... I just will try to be a bit ambitious about it. Um, yeah, so yeah, knight f6 makes a good makes good sense. And if I'm feeling particularly lazy and don't want to learn how to play knight f6 systems, um, learn this stuff instead. It's very forcing. And so because it's more forcing, there it's much simpler to find the plans and ideas um, based on having seen sample games uh, in this system. Uh, interestingly enough, knight e5 not in the list of moves. That, wait, there's knight... what is this? Knight... oh, that is an e. It looked... I'm not sure what I thought I saw here, but that is knight e5. Okay. I thought I saw something else, but yeah, knight f5, knight e5, bishop f5, d4. And just learn, like, a few, see some sample games, look at what black does in general here. Here, white's already committed to d4, which they don't want to do. Um, this might not be a, from a serious game, I'm not sure. Um, here, let's, can we promote this variation up one? Let's say bishop h5 just isn't that it's not that interesting. It has been played some. Uh, I don't like it. Um, or rather, I like bishop f5 better. Um, so as long as you learn, like, I mean, okay, this actually does not force white to play d4 immediately. Um, does f6 actually make sense here? I like knight f6, because knight f6 you can just play knight d7 and then push for c5 very quickly. That, although, again, we're not playing a Cairo, we're playing a London. You would never do these things in a London. Um, it's funny, this position's been reached 12 times. Right? 10 and 1 and 1, am I reading that right? 10 and 3 and 1? Something like that? These little numbers are so tiny here, but... Out of all these games, I don't think I like any of the top moves. I just play e6. 
I like e6 here. It makes a great deal of sense. And then you can push your f6 if you want to. Um, there's a whole lot of possibilities. Um, like here you get all this London play, but their knights over exposed on e5. Um, <laughs> Nakamura endorses it um, with the white pieces. Which means it's probably good for black, right? No. <laughs> uh, no. He just plays a lot of fun things. Um, I'm not sure why. But you know, he endorses this. That's kind of cool. Um, so, I mean, I don't think bishop h5 is anything special, right? This is very strongly resembling the game, and the bishop's still offsides here. It's never getting back into play on h5. On f5, it actually does something. Uh, so yeah, we don't need that move in our tree. Um, but yeah, like... And I'm amazed. Bishop d7's been played, and white's got an advantage here. In these must be blitz games or something. Um, <laughs> okay. So you got Nakamura playing the white side of this with, um, what do you play? This is Prognanodad, whatever his name is. And we got Nakamura playing knight f3. Um, I don't know. There's just a lot of things to look at here, but uh, let's see. <laughs> Bishop h5, drosh, move three, you know. I mean, if you open playing something kind of, I, I mean, it's equal and kind of boring from a pawn structure perspective. Um... Like, unless black's going to do something like f6 and e5, this is kind of boring for black. Uh, on the other hand, because black is immediately threatening to play f6, kind of surprised to see this. Like, is this not a thing? Or does that invite this? Like, what's going on? How is it that masters are playing d4, but black can play... Uh, f6 here. Okay, so g4... Wait, g4 isn't even the engine selected move. Um, yeah, black's just better here. Black wins. Okay. that It's that simple. You just play this and win with black. But no. Um, my point was that, like, it seems kind of weird that d4 is so popular, given that black has this immediate f6 threat. So I would have expected g4 to be the top move in this position, and I mean, it looks okay. Again, we get our double fianchetto stuff going, so how bad could it be? But also, this kind of looks like, or resembles, a uh, Trompowski. I've seen a few Trompowskis, but I stand, I have to learn a lot more about a lot of openings. Or maybe if my opponent plays knight f3, maybe I just play g6 and knight f6 and stuff, and don't try to get an advantage in the opening. Don't play any of this provocative stuff when you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> I don't know. Chess is hard. But I've got to come up with some kind of game plan against this stuff. I was twice caught off guard. Once by knight f3. A second time by b3. So, yeah, I'll, I don't know, I'll figure something out, because, like, what happened in the game was pretty painful, where I ended up playing, like, queen a5 here, and I'm just kind of struggling to come up with ideas in this position. Every move my opponent makes is resourceful, and I have no idea, like, what I'm doing, other than just generally trying to push for a c5 break. I thought I'd calculated enough to justify all this, and I thought it was okay, but um, my opponent plays knight c4, and I, 
I don't really have anything better than just retreating. I thought I did. I thought that queen a6 is just kind of brilliant here. And then... Can anybody guess what my opponent played? I don't even know if it's the best move, but it looked quite impressive here. It was after my next my opponent's next move that I realized that I'd made some pretty radically bad errors in judgment. Uh, although my position's not that great here anyway, but um, yeah, my opponent's next move was really interesting, at least in my opinion. Knight c5. We got one vote for knight c5. I had calculated enough to see that I'm not losing my queen. And I thought that all this pressure I had in my opponent's position was a very positive thing for my position here. Um, so that, those are kind of ideas that are floating in my head as I'm trying to figure out, well, how do I either restrict my opponent so they can't move forward while I figure out where I'm going to position all my pieces to try to get to a pawn break, or um, how do I tactically exploit some hole in their position? Um, or how do I get a pawn break directly? But my direct attempts at pawn breaks had not been going well so far. Um, okay, suppose it were Black's move. They say we gave Black an extra move. Um, so it was his, his turn here again. Um, what's some ideas that Black's thinking of playing here? If we need to narrow this line of thinking further, I can um, start offering some hints as to things that I've been trying to do that didn't quite work out here. Or maybe this position's a bit too difficult. Because believe it or not, I had gotten a position where I'm finally starting to form a plan, despite being in very severe time trouble. Um, at this point, we're on move 20. I've got 25 moves to go to time control, and I've got a half hour left. Um, my opponent has at least double my time. So, playing that kind of... I mean... I have had worse, but you really, against a strong player, you don't want to be in that kind of time trouble situation, which I got into because I just didn't know what I was doing. Um, well, I guess I'm not hearing any guesses, um, so I'll just offer my thoughts as to, like, well, as black, what I'm trying to do here. For the longest time, um... Uh, D5 is an interesting thought. Um, he didn't actually do that, although um, that didn't even cross my radar. Uh, well, I mean, earlier in the game it occurred to me that he could play D5. In this specific position, that idea didn't occur to me. Um, but tactically, it might work. My position is just bad enough that, you know... That might actually be a thing that uh, white can do. Although it's kind of scary after d5, c takes, e takes, bishop takes, knight. Um, it's not something I'd be comfortable playing as white, but my position kind of sucks as black. Um, Alright, so yeah. 
Yeah, we're looking at ways to like unwind black's pieces to try to strike at white's center. These are ideas. Um, yeah, d5 for white looks very interesting. Um, wow. Another reason I was not very afraid of d5, though, is because, like, worst case, it, he's just going to induce some weakness on my pawns on c6 or e6. Or he's going to end up pushing d6, maybe. But I figured, worst case, there's got to be some tactical resource that can get me out of this mess. Um, but no, d5 makes a lot of sense, but it just doesn't... Other than opening the bishop on the long diagonal, it doesn't achieve too much immediately. But e6 is pretty tender, so maybe? Um, well, so are these 3D pieces representative uh, of an over-the-board view? I would say, um, well, we'll say yes and no. Like, these pieces do have, like, shadows and such. They do overlay on top of each other. But it's not the same as playing on a 3D board. Um, the most obvious difference is that the board here is square. If you're playing on a real 3D perspective, you have vanishing point perspective. Depending on what height the table's at and what's the height of your chair and stuff like that. You get different angles. Um, um, yes, yeah, so the angles very different. The pieces themselves, I think, do do justice um, to a 3D set. Although I've have I've seen better, I've seen worse. Um, but yeah, looking at these as a 3D pieces that stack on top of each other is helping just when I actually go over the board uh, and play some games I use the same visualization skills that I'm using here or that's what I feel um, so I think having the 3D set is helpful to me it's not very great for the stream though but I like it a lot um, it's an interesting aesthetic but yeah so huh uh, yeah, my all my weaknesses are very tender, and d5 seems like this is the mer perfect moment to play it, if it's the critical idea in this position. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that d5 is actually what he's aiming for, because... I could start playing things like, I don't know, um, like knight c5, I guess. Um, it doesn't really help his pieces where they're currently positioned. Yeah, knight b4 looks very interesting and very good here. Um, He uh, he played here um, a move that deeply impressed me. And maybe I'm just completely off my rocker or something here. Because um, this didn't occur to me until he played it, but he played b4. And it just sunk into me, like, just how desperate my position is getting. Um, like, now I can't even get my c5 advance in ever. My opponent's got control of a5. I don't want to push b4 myself. And it becomes more difficult for me to try to advance my c-pawn later, um, thanks to this pawn, which is now cutting off all my pieces. Um, furthermore, any future tactical nonsense I might have had on the queen side here with the bishop taking on a3 just isn't going to happen anymore. Knight b6 here. Uh, let's see, is that what I did? Let's see. 
I didn't do knight b6. Um, so I played b6, but let's take a look at knight b6. Um, uh, what was going on in this position? Knight b6 makes good sense. And pawn b5 carries immense problems with it. Um, if I were to play b5, it just creates long-term weaknesses and doesn't really open any files for my pieces or any diagonals or anything. It does give me the c4 square, but uh, knight b6 also gives me the c4 square. Or, uh, or so I thought. During the game, I was thinking if I play knight b6, my opponent retreats their knight to either d2 or to e3. Um, and then if I play knight a4, they do uh, bishop a1. That's as far as I'd taken it during the game. Um, but maybe there's more truth to this position, because on b6 I can actually start to threaten knight d5 if they push e5. This really does open up possibilities for black. Um, oh, oh! I remember what spooked me out of this. Um, I was considering, what about knight c5? Um, so, forced is bishop takes, pawn takes. And I, I didn't like this at all. Um, yes, I guess I do get rid of all my opponent's knights. So that much I guess I appreciate. But this looks pretty not like a position I want to play. Um, don't forget, on knight e3, you could play knight d5 anyway. Take c4. Oh, push e5. Pushing e5 did not occur to me. Um, that's a really interesting thought. So having been fully denied the possibility of playing c5, the perfect, perfect moment arises to push e5 myself. I actually like that. Even if he pushes past, I still like it. Um, yeah, right, right. So this is forced. I still like this, though. Kind of. I mean, so my opponent has a very strong center. Compared to other stuff that could happen, this is okay, but... Um, So I've got this to worry about. I've got this. I've got this. Um, he's not going to take on c6. But he does have a strong pawn center. And he's got this rook b1 idea. Um, but e5 does seem liberating. Um, right. Might be too early to do e5, but if I don't play it, my opponent might at some point have the chance to play f4, e further complicating an e5 push, or they themselves might just push e5 directly. Although that'd be a really weird decision to make in a position with the bishop pair. Um, but it could be done, but I don't like it. Um, uh, also possible is this. I was less concerned about this because I don't have to exchange queens. Um, but um, it's not so clear what I'm doing. Uh, one idea would be like rook c7, rook d7. Um, <laughs> I wonder if the doubled a pawns would be a terrible liability. Uh, yeah, because I can't hack down the center fast enough, so that's out. I can't play that immediately anyway. Um, 
fun stuff though. Um, hmm. I did not look at this. But again, I didn't think Queen C4 was the critical line anyway. Um, but no, during this line, I didn't think I had. I thought I did not have anything here. Um, White's play is just very fast. But I could fix my pawn uh, structure defect like this. Um, I still think my play is far too slow and I'm far too cramped for me to be opening the queen side like that. So I can't play b5 right away, and if I can't, then I have these long-term weaknesses to worry about. Yeah. Well, my knight got to f8 because, like you said, I misplayed my knights this game. But knight b6 is a really interesting move because it does give me some freedom. Some very much needed freedom, but... um, Yeah. Knight b6 makes some, a good deal of sense, but it's not enough here. Um, White's plays. White's just got a very large space advantage, so Black needs to maneuver behind his pawns until a useful pawn lever occurs. And that's not going to happen as long as I keep blundering. But yeah, in the game I played b6, figuring, well, now I really need to go for broke. I need to make a pawn lever happen, even if it means I've got some weaknesses that might end up losing me material. That's a chance I have to take at this point, because like my pieces are so stuck. Um, I need to get active before it's too late. So, knight b6 makes sense, but it just saddles me with too many weaknesses. So I try to like force a c5 advance um, and hope for complications. Uh, not saying that's necessarily a good idea, but Hopefully it's a practical one. So my opponent steps out of this um, pin thing I had going, um, and so I continue. Or I also put more pressure on the c5 square, as do I. Um, so I'm trying to force the c5 to happen. Um, and to my very great shock and surprise, they play knight c to e5 here. I couldn't believe it. Like, yes, of course I'll trade pieces with you. I need to trade pieces. Um, like, what is this even about? Why would you do that? Um, uh, Stockfish, what would it do? Bishop f1 was a thing I was very concerned about. I wasn't sure if I was going to ultimately push c5 after all because of bishop f1 and just this nightmare of tactics that could all arise on this diagonal here. Um, I was very concerned about that, even though it does temporary, temporarily loosen the pressure on the c6 square. On f1, this is just a monster. Um, yeah, let's just put it there. I can look in that and the PGN afterward, but yeah, this uh, I like my opponent played so well leading up to this point, and then they played knight e5, and I'm like, what is this? Did I like blunder material or something? Um, maybe they calculated they could win my c pawn or something. I don't know, but. Like, giving up a pawn for activity is very beneficial for black here. Assuming black has to give up the material, and maybe he doesn't. Uh, well, so, in the game, I hear I played just knight takes knight. Just very grateful to exchange stuff, as I have, like, 15 minutes left on my clock. Uh, in which to play how many moves? 20... how many... We're on move 23. I've got to get to move 45 and through move 45. So I've got um, can make another 22 moves 
in 15 minutes. Not a good situation, but uh, what's the best thing here? C5 after all. Yikes, wow. C5, D5. Uh, okay. Interesting. Now why is D5 best though? Is there some tactic saying that white should not take either of the two ways that white could take on c5? Um, that is with either pawn? Is there some tactic reason why white doesn't want to play bishop f1 anyway? This gets really complicated, but d5 does open up the black's pawn structure and makes the c pawn as useless as possible. Uh, we liquidate and black just needs to go for activity one way or another here. Uh, but yeah, white has a clear space advantage. And there are many holes in black's position, despite there not being any pawn structure defects, other than the h6. Um, so that's how that could have proceeded. Um, no, in the actual game, I just trade on e5, white takes on e5, and I offer another trade. I'm like, this is great. Yeah, let's just keep liquidating. Um, that's a bit optimistic, but actually my opponent uh, obliged, and suddenly I'm looking at a position that's not completely terrible. It's just bad, but not... It's a lesser degree of bad than it used to be. Um, because I'm not nearly as cramped, and it's very difficult for my opponent's pawn levers to do anything now. And I can apply all kinds of pressure on their center suddenly, because my pieces aren't tripping over each other the whole time. Um, it's true, I can't play knight d5 anymore, but... Yeah, it's simpler for both players, I think. I just could not believe that this happened. Um... But it did, so I shouldn't belabor the point anymore. Um, my opponent... Uh, how quickly do they play this? Do I have any note about that? No, they they spent some time. They came up with d5 here. And, yeah, stuff's happening. Um, this exploits the fact that my c-pawn is pinned. This is an exciting position, isn't it? My goodness, what does one do in this position? Um, and so I spent uh, about five minutes of my remaining... Actually, it's 16. Um, I came up with a move here. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if I should be proud of it or not. Yeah, this is a really wild game. Um... That's what, I was really not impressed with my opening, but this got interesting. So, candidate moves. Rook c7, rook c7, rook d8, rook d8, bishop f6, queen a4, a5, c5, um, e takes d5, bishop f8, uh, any other candidate moves here? Well, bishop g5 was temporarily a candidate move. It's pretty easily answered. Um, I think that's our list of candidate moves in this position. A lot of moves are candidate moves here. A common theme is that very many of these candidate moves get smashed um, by white's pawn taking one of our pawns. And the position just gets very unfortunate there. Um, yeah, black was almost in position to line up the rooks and stop this d5 advance from happening. But black was just a touch too slow. And got caught up in some tactics. But white didn't... Um, this is not nearly the clear, cleanest way that white could have converted this position. Okay, well... Um, 
After five minutes thought, I came up with C5. I don't know if that's good. Let's see, what does the engine suggest? Queen A4 is a candidate. White is considerably better even after Queen A4. Huh. I thought that... Hmm. This wasn't necessarily that great for white. It's very difficult for white. Unless white can win a pawn somehow. If white can win a pawn, then... Then I think that white can clearly be see, said to be better. But I think this is falling under the realm of unclear. Despite a plus two engine evaluation. So after my move, c5. Okay, white's like plus three here. Bishop f1? Really? What is this madness? How is that the move? Okay, so I played c5. My opponent did play bishop f1. I still don't appreciate this, because I played queen a4. Um... So, engine prefers pawn takes pawn, which makes some sense. It is tricky for me to hold on to my center. Um, oh, am I losing an exchange? Oh. Oh, okay. Both of us missed that. Um, I don't... Yeah, I'm not going to speak for my opponent and how they missed that. That's just random luck, I guess. A lot of my games feature a lot of random luck, in case that hasn't been noticed. Like, if white had spotted this pawn takes pawn, followed by bishop um, c4, and then this checkers-like thing where all of black's pieces are in light squares and they're all hanging. Um... If he'd spotted that and played it, um, this would be a d very different game. Um, Alright. Instead, my opponent did play bishop c4 straight away. Um, so, of course, I take to avoid getting a weakness. Okay, but yeah, pawn takes pawn was just devastating here. Um, amazing. Because, yeah, I think I was going to react like pawn takes pawn, and then bishop c4. Somehow I thought I was defending this. What's the complication here? What is it that makes this... Wait, was it bishop c4 straight away, or was it something else here? It was bishop c4. The engine's recommending bishop g6 because this fails how? b5, queen d6, queen b3. Oh! Wow! Holy moly! That's a tactic if you've ever seen one. Okay, so that's what my opponent missed. I clearly missed all that, too. Like, I saw bishop c4, queen c6, but um, didn't see b5 to follow this. Yeah, b5 is just murderous. Um, the other thing I was worried about here, I don't know if this is ironic in any way or not, but like a uh, pawn to b5. And actually, no, I think that was my greatest concern here is that after bishop c4, uh, my opponent might be greedy and try to play pawn b5 and try to trap my queen. Like, it occurred to me that in some lines where uh, there ends up being a discovery here, not there, if they end up playing bishop b3 and somehow I get my queen trapped by this bishop pair and have to take on a3 and then they start sacking on my king side. I think that was the idea that went in both of our heads at this time, is that... Well, White's going to try to gambit his queen side in the hopes of getting a murderous king side attack. Um, but I defended reasonably well. 
Um, starting with pawn takes pawn, saying, yeah, I realize that my center is kind of dissolved and such, but this, I think, is a reasonable decision from black. Uh, yeah, yeah, Stockfish agrees. Pawn takes pawn, and black's out of the woods, kind of. Um, so they played bishop takes, and I played uh, d rook to d8. Just saying, you know, okay, you've got more space. Well done, white. Um, but we have a game ahead of us. Uh, queen f3. What's going on there? I thought I had everything covered, even after queen f3. I had ideas of both bishop g6 and rook f8. Um, or, I'm sorry, I also had queen e8 ideas. I did, this did occur to me. Um, yeah, queen e8 was my brilliant idea here to get me back into the game. It's not that brilliant, but it does reactivate my pieces and start to give me control of squares that matter. Um, but apparently white still stands better there. In fact, that is how the game proceeded. <laughs> no point in drawing the arrows, because that's where we went. Um, then my opponent plays queen g4. And is bishop f8 best? Because that's what I played. Queen f8 is better. Queen f8 is more flexible. This is a difficult decision to make. Um, I'll just note this is a side variation that it's more flexible to play queen f8, and we'll see why in the game, why this doesn't quite work out the best. Uh, so I play bishop f8, they play bc5. Um, yeah, and so I just keep trading, you know? The more things we trade, okay, I did make a c-pawn weakness, but I've got so much activity for it that uh, this one isolated pawn weakness that's already defended. And I've got so much pressure and activity here. Yes, my pieces are on bad squares, but they're very easy to activate. So, I thought this was better for white, but not that much better. And I thought this is something I could actually play and probably draw. Um, it's worth noting I had like two and a half minutes at this point <laughs> to my opponent's 40. Um, but let's see how this played out. So, rook e3, good developing move. Uh, I offer a queen trade. I'm not sure if that was a good idea or not, but my opponent declines. Um, and here they're hitting f7. I activate my bishop, which allows me to move my king and start moving these pawns around. Um, so making some progress. I was really concerned about this possibility of all their pieces lining up on f7. So I figured bishop g6 was necessary sooner or later. This was a pivotal moment in the game. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there have been plenty of moments in this game, but um, this was asking for it. Um, so, got two minutes on the clock. I spent one minute coming up with this next move. <laughs> Uh, you probably already know what it is, given that I've kind of given it away. But um, I thought this was a really important move. And my opponent still has like 39 minutes left to my two. So the um, question is, do we take or do we not take? I still don't know if I made the right decision here. It's tough.
So candidate moves here. Queen takes pawn, rook e8, rook c8, bishop d6, even c4 can be in the candidate move list, or some miscellaneous pawn moves like a6 or h5, as well as the king moves like king h8 and king h7. There's a lot of candidate moves here. Well, so, um, my thoughts around this point in the game were, oh my goodness, we just got out of that really complicated middle game position. We're getting closer and closer to an end game. I happen to know a lot of end games. Right, so that was the big decision here, is like, do I play like rook c8 and try to push my pawn? Um, do I stand pat? Do I try to activate that bishop on f8? Do I start like moving my king in some desperate sort of defensive maneuver? Um, even rook e8 comes to mind here. Um, or do you just take on h3? Um, and about 40 to 50 seconds into this thought interval, it, this thought had been occurring to me throughout that whole minute um, was that, well, supposing that we can take on h3, if it works out, um, all the rest of this is going to be really easy to calculate in the next um, 10 moves to time control, even though we have one minute left. Um, whereas if I don't take on h3, um, then I'm going to have to calculate really complicated things every move until the time control happens. Um, so because I've mismanaged my time, I had to decide, like, is taking on h3 suicide or is it playable? Um, and about a minute into the thought process, it, I just could not find any way for white to get a decisive advantage. Um, so I did this move that surprised my opponent. At least I think it did. Um, Stockfish kind of likes it. Kind of likes bishop d6. It's an idea. Um, I kind of like rook e8. Unless there's something terribly wrong with it. Um, I guess that encourages king h2. Okay, so that's not so great. But bishop d6 is probably the best move here, then. Bishop d6 did also occur to me, but... Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, had I had more time, I probably would have played this. Because now we get to exchange on my terms. Um, and I don't have to give up my f-pawn. Um... Yeah, so this would have been the best way to go. Um, but I played this. I thought I saw tactics that actually gave black an advantage here. Um, turns out I was mistaken. But um, So we go down the rabbit hole. Uh, King h8. Uh, rook d3, was it? Oh, two, two, two. Yeah, rook d3. This surprised me. Um, I thought my position was amazing, and then I saw this, and I'm like, uh-oh, this is not so good. Um, so, um, yeah, so there's a dual threat here. One, obviously, if I take the rook, uh, I get mated by queen takes bishop, queen takes pawn mate. Two, if I just like completely blow this off, um, let's see, I mean, is that what I did during the game? Because then, um, well, no, where am I? Yeah. 
Okay. Two was that um, my opponent's eventually threatening to move their rook onto the seventh and try to do some similar tactics with bishop takes g7. So I can't, like, play rook c8 and try to hold this position forever. Um, so... Yeah, if I like play just a do nothing move to get the rook out of harm's way, then rook d7 strikes and things start to hurt a lot. Um, so I need something more active here than rook c8. Um, let's see. trying to remember everything I calculated. I calculated a lot of things in a hurry here. I think I was looking at, like, if I play queen c8, they have rook b3 to rook b7. Um, and it's that's troublesome, again. Ultimately, I settled on rook b8, but I think if I'd played this, I think this is crushing. Um... So let's take a look. Rook takes rook, king g2. What about this? Queen to g4. Now why g4? Is there some perpetual idea? Oh, g4 defends the... Okay. g4 defends the g-pawn. So that's my third defender. Like I said, I was miscounting a lot during this game. Somehow I thought that would only defend the square twice. I didn't count the fact that the king actually defends the square, too. Um, so it would have been okay to just play queen c8. Um, but here I play rook b8. Um, they played rook d2. I didn't expect this. Um, I really thought they were going to do rook d7. I think at this point I have to sack my queen for rook and minor piece. Yeah, wait, no? No? King h7. King h7 is better than queen sack. Well, not necessarily better, but um, what's wrong with the queen sack? I mean, yes, the endgame sucks, but is it really that bad? I guess white just runs the a-pawn down the board. Um, so I guess that endgame's no good. Yeah, king h7 is amazing. Um, so... Oh, that's clever. So this is not check. So if bishop takes g7... There's rook to b1. Oh. Holy moly. I think I would have found that just out of sheer desperation. Um, I would have spent time looking. I think I could have found that move only because the end game after queen takes rook is just lost. So I would have looked like just verified have I covered all my bases with candidate moves. But yeah, that's really tricky. Um, right, so yeah, the, it wouldn't have taken me too long to figure out that queen takes rook is just lost. And so I would have done one more search to try to find candidate moves. I would have found this, but it's still pretty spooky. <laughs> but yeah, what a move. But that didn't happen in the game. My rook b8 had spooked him into playing rook to d2. After which, I'm still in huge, 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 huge time trouble. Um, so I'm just trying to make threats at this point. Uh, I'm like, hey, I can hit this. I can hit it twice. Isn't this great? And, oh look, they pushed the pawn. Fine. But now I've got threats here. Um, and I've pinned this pawn. So it's not advancing anymore. Um... 
Whoops, why do I have so many arrows? I can't see where all my arrows begin and end. There it is. Um, so I've got this pin. I've got potential ideas of queen f3 if my opponent moves their queen. Um, I might even be able to push h5, h4 and lift my rook over. Like, this is amazing. This is spectacular compared to what we had a while ago. Oh! You don't get why we have to play king h7 in that line. Really? Uh, the point is, um, I guess, suppose we do something else like c4, right? What else were you considering? You're considering, like, queen g4? Um... Hmm. Like, if queen g4... We just take this pawn. Um... But yeah, the point here is that this is not check, because we're in check. Um, I was for sure threatening this sneaky rook b1 mate thing. That was like my ulterior motive behind playing rook b8. Um, Despite that my opponent didn't fall for it. Um, so anyway, this is still an amazing, amazing position here. Um, yeah, knowing your end games helps you um, make all kinds of fun little threats toward the end. Even if you're in dire, dire time situations, you can often pull off some nonsense that otherwise would not work. So my opponent's playing safe moves at this point. Um, queen c6 does hit my rook. Um, so I play queen h5. Again, controlling this square again, still attacking this. Threatening that I could move my rook somewhere if I want to. Um, I realized that if I moved my rook up off the back rank, that rook d8 was just not something I wanted to see at all. Um, another idea here could have been rook c8 and trying to race my c-pawn. I did not have time to look at this, but is this any good? Queen d7. Uh, queen b7. I think queen d7 is the better move, Stockfish. Pretty sure it's queen d7. Um, right, and so e5 does not hang, and this position is not that pleasant. Because, well, I was going to say because they could play a4 and bishop c3, but they don't have time for it. Um, why the king move here? What's so great about this king move? Oh, we need to stop the e-pawn. Right. Hello. Um, right, and then bishop c3 stopping black's advances. And this is just really pleasant for white. Um, but not necessarily winning. It's something white would have to fight and fight and fight on. Eventually, white probably wins this, but uh, considering what just transpired in the moves before this, um, it's not the worst thing that could happen for black. But I kind of liked what I did better than rook c8. I liked queen h5 here. Although it does make it difficult for me to push my h-pawn and try to smash this open. Um, and with that, oh wait, no. Then they play e6. So I double up on the pawn and threaten queen b1. Um, again, I really want to get onto the long diagonal and try to mate the king. Um, so they defend their pawn. Um, 
and I go back and we've made time control. Now let's blunder check all this. Like, did I miss any winning shots here? I don't think I did. I don't think I missed any winning chances. Uh, Rook B8 is interesting. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, okay, so here Rook E8 is not very good. Queen F3 directly should have been played. Okay. In light of how the game actually progressed, that makes a great deal of sense. Oh no, no, we made the time control. Um, so then the game continues. Um, we were both pretty tired at this point, but let's try to activate my pieces, you know. Um, and so, what was I thinking about here? I spent forever calculating stuff here, ultimately came up with queen g5, which is very tricky. Um, and this allows me to bring my rook out on the f-file. And they had the gall to take my a-pawn. So, it's a wild, wild position, and that takes balls to do. But, I mean, if white doesn't do it, he's not trying to win. But, um, so we proceed queen f5, temporarily hanging the bishop, but getting all kinds of fun activity. Um, rook e2, queen g5, noting that the rook has been lifted out the back rank, so this queen c1 threat. Um, bishop d2. Queen f6, threatening checking back here, getting my queen active behind there. Um, they activate their queen on the long diagonal. So it's a very good move on their part. Bishop d6, threatening to sack on g3. And they'd actually lifted up their queen and tried putting it on a few different squares on this diagonal. Um, they never let go of it, but they were indecisive in their move. Um, I was polite. I didn't speak up or anything about it. Because, um, I mean, surely during the game I had some moments where I must have done the similar things. I'm not gonna... I mean, this is a pretty friendly league that we're playing in, despite how competitive some of the people get about it. Um, so, anyway... Um, they settled on queen e4, which is a good move. Um, I activate my rook, king g2, king g8, trying to get in the way of this pawn, a4, um, king f8, again, trying to get in the way of the pawn, uh, a5, and now I need to get behind that pawn before it runs any further. So rook to b3. And white plays rook e3. And after some consideration, I concede here. Uh, white wins. Black has no threats. White has multiple threats. Black's position is completely collapsing. There's really nothing black can do here. Plus, it's like almost midnight. We needed to pack up and go home. Everybody else had left, um, like forever ago. Uh, so I got to clean up all the chess boards and sets and clocks and stuff. And take care of rearranging everything in the studio, recording the result, reporting the result to the team captain, and all this fun stuff. Uh, so I just elected to concede at this point. Um, but yeah, black is just having a really poor time in this position. That said, we can back up and take a look at things before Stockfish is like announcing mate in 300 here. Um, and see like, was there a chance for black to do stuff here? Um, what chances were missed? Oh, it looks like white was pretty much in the clear the whole time. Whoa, 
Queen takes bishop works. What? What? What is this? Either my notation's wrong, or we both had a hallucination here. Oh, g7 is loose. g7 is very loose. Oh. Um, but still. Okay. So I can't sack that bishop. So that's why I got so much activity there, is because I made a terrible move and my opponent didn't exploit it. Okay. Um, yeah, before the time control, my shuffling back and forth didn't help me any. My queen g5 that I was so proud of really wasn't that great. Um, if black's going to try to do something complicated, queen g5 is the complicated move. If black is going to silently whimper until he loses, uh, a6 is the way to do that. But yeah, Stockfish points out a6 is best, in some sense of the word best, but no. No, it really isn't. Um, but, okay, d yeah, queen h5 was not good here. Like, throughout the game I've had problems with activating my pieces, and this is no exception. Here it legitimately is difficult to activate them, but still, that's not an excuse. I mean, it's an excuse, but we don't want to make excuses. We want to play good moves. Um, so king h7 seems reasonable as anything, but I guess my chances were before that pawn got to e6. Um, yeah, queen f3 would have been a huge find in this position. Now, is there some reason they don't just push? Um... Oh, yes, there is a reason. Right. Just kidding. Um, so, yeah, so this is why Stockfish is recommending this line. And black's okay. We just play c4, and finally black gets to activate his final piece. Um, that would have been really, 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 really good. Um, having missed that, what other chances were missed? Queen f5 did not help my position any. My pieces are constantly entombed by both my opponent's pawns and my own pawns. And I'm playing hope chess here. I really should play more actively. Granted, the rook on b8 doesn't do the job, but uh, if I'd find rook b8 and found h5... I might have played this. Um, okay, and I can't play h4 because something. Okay, what happens if h4? Queen f4, kind of forcing a queen trade. And this endgame. Hmm. Uh, let's see. I agree, g6 is the move here. How do you evaluate this, though? Stockfish says better for white. Um, hmm. I mean, it's better than what happened in the game. That's for sure. But, yeah, you know, I don't think this is... Certainly is not better for black. So I can't feel too bad about missing that. But having played rook e8 in the first place was a huge error in judgment. Like, even if I'm not playing queen f3, rook e8 is a terrible move. I should try to avoid making such terrible moves in the future and try to find something more constructive. Although, apparently h5... What's going on here? I want to play h4. Okay. I mean, this idea did occur to me in other variations. I guess... No, it actually occurred to me during the game that this rook lift is crushing if I push h5. I think it was in this position that I decided against h5. 
despite really wanting to play it. I managed to talk myself out of it, but I didn't find Queen F3. Um, Queen F3 would have been a better play. Um, but yeah, I think throughout the game my opponent was better the whole time. So, I played reasonably well, um, tactically at least. Um, strategically, my game was pretty terrible. Uh, like, I did manage to not blow the game to a tactic, um, at least not directly. I'm trying to remember how my first game. Now, both of my most recent games um, this season, I've succeeded at not blowing the game to a tactic, um, but just gradually got crowned down in both cases. Um, I have a... Huh. Let me see if I can find some older games. Not because that's going to help at all with... Um, Oh, what's it? It's not going to help us understand what happened in that particular game, but you can take a look at some of my older games to get a sense of um, like what my play style is typically like and how I've gotten uh, feedback from teammates uh, about uh, things I've done in the past. Is this in keeping with my style? Well, no, actually, hmm, this last year, um, I've actually done really well on the tactical side of things. Yes, I did blow this game to a tactic at some point, but, um, okay. Fair enough, but this is, like, strategically lost the whole time, too. So that's not an example. Um, let's see. Do you have any older games? If not, that I guess that's okay. Yeah, I guess... I suppose we don't have any examples of my games from like more than a year ago on Leech Us. Um, or rather, studies of my OTB games from over a year ago. I don't have not uploaded any of those. Um, but generally, um, my playing style has been just very wildly ridiculous tactical skirmishes um, from which I've learned nothing, basically. Um, but I have managed to win a number of those, and I've managed to lose a few, too. That's just it's kind of a roll of the dice, what's been happening in those games. Um, and so I guess, like, throughout this last year with this league, I've been setting out to try to don't do the crazy nonsense stuff that I generally have done. Like, in the case of this game, um, I don't know why the up arrow key doesn't take me to the top of the move list, but we can go back this way too. Um, so, this particular game, um, the crazy stuff I would have done would have been something like G5, but something much more extreme than that. Like, G5 is just the tip of the iceberg for, like, crazy stuff that I would do. Um, what would be another example of something that would, like, typify my style? Well, I played a London here. It's hard to say that there's anything tactically interesting I can do in a London. Um... But generally, my games involve me getting a completely lost position in the early middle game. Um, getting an even more lost late middle game, and then winning on a tactic. It's generally how things have gone um, throughout my entire tenure in this league, uh, for however many years we've played it. Usually I get these very complicated positions that just constantly get more and more complicated every turn. 
and eventually my opponent um, doesn't either doesn't know their end games, and so I'm able to liquidate into a favorable end game, or they see an end game that spooks them and um, they end up making some tactical mistake, and I just pounce on top of it and I win a piece and then have to convert my um, advantage. Yeah, it's it's very unrewarding playing that way, though. Not that losing every game is rewarding either, but um, been trying to do games that have been a bit more positional in nature and less complete nonsense. Um, but I've not done too well with that this um, year, I guess. That said, I think all my opponents this year have or most of them have outrated me. So I can't despair yet. But it's just, it's funny, this was um, board one of our B team. Um, ended up playing against um, a 2100 here. So, I mean, sure, I myself am like 2000. Um, but yeah, both of us fielded team lineups that didn't, in my opinion, make any sense. But um, it just happened to be who was available at the time to play the matches, at least on our side. Um, on their side, I think they brought a very strong board one on purpose, or maybe they just, again, had difficulty fielding the right team around this time of year or something. Generally, you don't put a very strong board one and then have really low-rated players on all the other boards. Generally, you don't want to do that. Um, and I think we did, like, on average, outrate them 25 to 50 points on all the other boards. And so we won the match by a decisive margin, but my game, <laughs> uh, I lost. Which was not a big surprise, but what was surprising is that I almost drew it, in some sense of the word, almost. I mean, I think I played okay. My strategy was severely lacking. I kept trying to use tactics to justify everything because I just strategically was at a loss. Um, other than coming up with just all the reasons why my position was bad, I couldn't come up with any pros for Black's position. And I think part of that is just a lack of familiarity with Queen Pawn games and Queen Pawn structures. So, yeah. Um, but hey, our team won the match, so that's a positive outcome. Um, 